the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, loves to speak light into hearts and minds. God wrote a book, and with his book, these words in front of us, he wakens our dead, bored souls. He frees us from bondage to sin, from desires that rob us of life. He comforts the depressed, inspires the discouraged, guides the confused. He empowers us to make our lives count for his cause in the world. He satisfies us completely and forever with words, his words. Another sight of him, another miracle, another glimpse of my God. I love that line, another glimpse of my God. If you want to get uh, your notes out today, we're going to jump right into the message because I got a lot to share with you today and I want to make sure we keep going and, and get through all of it because it's really powerful. Last week we started a collection of talks called Spiritual Questions. Every month, we kind of take one topic or one conversation to lean in on. And last week, we started with the question of who is God? And we unpacked not the idea, but the facts that God is spirit, meaning he is before and after. He is the alpha and omega. He is the I am, which, meaning, which means he simply exists because he does. And if that's sometimes a little head hurting or hard to explain, it's supposed to be that way. But what we know as believers, as, as followers of Jesus, is that God is not just a spirit that is all powerful at a distance. The second thing is, is he is personal. That who, that's who God is. You can know him today. You can connect with him. Listen, it might be your first time back in church in a long time. We believe here at Local City Church, you can have a moment with God today where he can speak to you and let you know that he's always been with you, that he's there for you right now in this moment. Today, we're talking about a question I think that's going to be very powerful for a lot, all of us in here. For those of us, maybe our faith is going strong and, and we're leaning into some new things. I believe today is going to give us confidence to keep building on what God is doing in our life. And maybe we're in our faith and we're, we're starting to have some questions or doubts. The answer to the question today is going to give you, again, that foundation that you can ask those questions on. To give you something that you can trust in. To give you something that you can know is always going to be available to you. And maybe the third area or group of people that might be in here, again, is maybe you don't have any faith right now and you still don't really know what you think about God or Jesus. Well, what I wanna do is invite you to look at this thing in my hands and see how powerful it is. Today's question is, can I trust the Bible? Can I trust the Bible? If you underline that phrase, trust for me. Because over the next few minutes, what I wanna do this morning is spoiler alert, spoiler alert, alert <laughs> prove to you that the answer to this question is yes, 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 a thousand times yes. This is more than just a history book. It's more than just words on pages. This is a powerful letter to us from the Creator God. This is a message that is life-saving, life-changing, and has stood the test of time. And I love this idea that we have this in our hands today, that we can lean into the things of God. I want you to think about this quote. I put a quote on your notes from a guy named Eugene Peterson. He's the author of the Message Bible, where he translated God's word into this beautiful poetic translation. Here's what he says. The Bible is not a script for a funeral. Well, some of us might need to hear that today. The Bible is not a script for a funeral. It is a record of God always bringing life where we expected to find death. Everywhere is the story of resurrection. What I wanna tell you today is that in my hands, in between the covers of this book, is life, is purpose, is strength, is hope, is miraculous power that is available to you today. 
And I wanna kinda dispel the rumors that this doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about today or has no context to speak into our current day life. It's just not true. See, the Apostle Paul who wrote a ton of the New Testament, which is kind of the second part of the Bible, he tells us in Colossians chapter three, verse 16, he says, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Would you circle that phrase for me? Fill your lives to teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives, to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Paul in this first line is bringing it back to what's most important. Let the message about Jesus fill your lives. I wanna tell you today, this book is a demonstration, is a record of just how far God is willing to go to show you how much he loves you, to invite you to experience his glory and his honor and his presence today so that that message can fill your lives, so that the good news of Jesus can fill your lives. Turn to the person next to you, tell them, hey, I got good news for you. Hey, I got good news for you. I got good news for you today. God's here in this place. God's with you. God has shown us who he is. See, what I love about this Bible is that it's, can go with us wherever we go. And I know that in my life, I've prayed for miracles to happen. I've prayed for God to show up and do incredible things. What I want you to realize today, I want you to write this down, is that the Bible is a handheld miracle. The Bible is a handheld miracle. I remember when I was a kid, handheld video games started to come out, right? The Game Boy, if you remember that, right? It was, see now things, everything is so small. Man, when the Game Boy first came out, it was like this giant light gray brick that you, there was no colors, right? And you would play these games like, oh my gosh, I can take this game anywhere, right? I remember on my first cell phone I ever had, it was a very reliable Nokia cell phone. Anyone have a Nokia back in the day? Yeah, I loved a Nokia cell phone because you know, now you're so nervous about dropping your phone. I mean, I could take that thing and chuck it against the wall as hard as I could. And it was, it was, hello, still working, right? And that had games on it too. I remember I was like a snake champion on my old Nokia phone. I was so good to have something that was fun and exciting in my hands where I could connect with people and it would impact my day. It was amazing. And what God's really shown me recently is that that's the reason he placed this in our hands is so that we could communicate with him so that it could bring joy in our life wherever we go. It could bring truth and honesty and hope in our life wherever we go. Let me just give you some truth about the Bible, all right? Why it's amazing that this is a miracle because it's still the same message, the same words, the same stories that Jesus was telling is in our hands. I'm gonna prove that to you today. But think about this, why this is a miracle, is that the Bible has over 40 different authors. It was written over three different continents in three different languages over a period of almost 2,000 years. 40 authors, three continents, three languages, 2,000 years. One message, God's come to earth as his son Jesus to forgive us and free us. God created us with purpose and life. He breathed life into us from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth and all the way to the end, a new thing is coming. Jesus is building a new thing from Genesis to Revelation, what I hold in my hands, what's available in an app on your phone is a handheld miracle. And I want you to know this today before we pray and jump into it, is that the Bible, why is it so powerful? Is that the Bible is a God book not a man book. As I'm gonna tell you today, yes, men wrote the words in here, but it was because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. That yes, that the men put action to this and authored the things that you see, but it was God who breathed life into the pages of this word. It's a God book. And man, it, that means for me, I can turn to this thing and I can trust it more than I trust anything else. And I can lean into the power that's found between the lines and between the pages. So. Again, spoiler alert, the answer is yes, that you can trust the Bible. And I would ask for you just to open your hearts today, to open your minds, to really lean in to what God's gonna speak to us today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me and let's jump into this. God, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful, God, that we can read it, we can open it up, and even when we have questions, God, you've provided proof, you've provided explanations, you've always been there for us. God, I pray today we would listen and lean in and write notes down. God, I pray for everyone in this room. I pray for all of our local city kids. 
God, I pray that you would help them have an amazing time at church as they learn the Bible and as they sing songs and they learn about Jesus. God, help their faith start right now at a young age. And God, we're so thankful for you. God, we believe you, we trust you, and we know you're a good God. In Jesus' name, we all say and agree. Come on, if you're ready for the message, give me a clap. Let's jump into it today, all right? I was talking with someone today. I, I got to be honest, I need all the encouragement I can get because, you know, Sundays are, are good days probably for our Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but I'm telling you, as a Florida State fan, I am just sad every week, all right? And the only thing redeeming about yesterday was that Miami and Florida lost too. That's the only thing I look forward to now, all right? So, yeah, you can cry with me for this weekend, Hurricane and Gator fans alike. Uh, but it's so funny how things like that impact us and affect us, these little occurrences during our day. I remember yesterday, uh, I was shopping for some stuff at Home Depot, and, and I like to, you know, go into Home Depot with a little bit of research, kind of making it seem like I know what I'm looking for, and I was actually looking for some hardware for some of our equipment here at church, and I was, remember I was looking for the right size bolts and screws and washers and all of that, and I guess I really looked like I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> I guess I really looked like I was a professional in this thing, because a guy came up to me, he was like, hey, I'm doing this project at my house, uh, which, which screw is better to use? And he had these boxes, these big, like, blue screws. He's like, which one's better to use? And in my mind, I'm like, don't answer this question because you have no idea which one is better to use. You're gonna, this guy's going to build something in his house. It's going to fall apart. You're going to destroy this man's house because you, you don't want to look foolish. And I will be honest with you, I answered the question in a very confident way. I have no idea if it was accurate or not, right? He had these two boxes of screws, and this is what I said. I was like, oh, yeah, that's, this is the one you want. It, it's longer. It's stronger because it's longer, right? It's, that's the one you should use. He's like, oh, thanks so much, man. I'm like, why did I just say that? I should have said, I don't know, right? Because sometimes it's okay to not know. And sometimes it's okay to say, hey man, I'm just, I mean, I, I, I'm as clueless as you are with this stuff, so you might want to find a guy in an orange vest who can help you out a little bit better, because I don't know if you want to ask me, but hey, I stepped in with confidence, and who knows if that guy's thing is still together or if it's broken already, but hey, I tried to give the best answer I could. See, in life, I think sometimes we approach that, we approach life this way. When we have a problem, we have a situation that we don't necessarily understand, and we go to people who sound really confident that they know what they're talking about because their appearance looks like they know what they're talking about. They have success. They seem healthy. But really, when we ask them about life or about the deep spiritual things of who we are, they're just as clueless as you are. <laughs> they're just as clueless as the next person. And what I love about God is that he gave us this tool to when we have questions, we can literally go and see what he says about it. See, what's happening a lot today, and I just got to be honest with you, what's happening a lot today in our faith is people are second-guessing God's Word. They're second-guessing and, and starting to look through it a, a, their own comfortable lens, right? Now, I'm okay with, I, I understand that in our faith right now, we're going through things like deconstruction and thinking about things, but I want to tell you today, you should not deconstruct what God's Word says. You should not deconstruct the words that are in these scriptures because they are God's Word, and they know better than we do. I read this quote the other day, and I, I was like, should I share this? And I'm like, yeah, we're going, we're going hard today, so I'll go ahead and share it. It was from someone, I was, as I was studying up for this message, he said, when you're reading the Bible, and when you're reading words on the page, and in your mind you think, oh, that's weird, or I don't know if I agree with that, just assume that you're wrong and the Bible's right, <laughs> because it's God's word, and he knows way better than you do. And i got to be honest, there's some humility that we have to take when we approach this thing. But why the Bible? Why is it so important? Well, let me give you two reasons. Number one is because God wants a relationship with his people. Why the Bible? Because God wants to have a relationship with you. Because God wants to connect with you. Because God wants you to know who he is. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created us. We know that. But what else do you see? That God established a relationship with the first two humans, Adam and Eve. He walked through the garden with them. He created beautiful plants and, and animals and a creation that they could experience together. The first thing that the enemy does is rob Adam and Eve of their relationship with God. What does he introduce? Shame and guilt. And what God simply wants to walk through his creation with his people, we're hiding. They're hiding in their shame. They're hiding in their sin. They're hiding in the mistakes that they've made. But what is God doing? Still walking through the garden, searching for his kids. God wants a relationship with you. He didn't have to give us this. He goes, all right, good luck. Here's what I said a long time ago, and hopefully, you know, telephone, it gets passed down. If you ever played telephone as a kindergartner, you know that that does not end well at all, or even as an adult, right? 
We got some mumblers out there. We got people who need to enunciate, right? But God wants a relationship with his people. It's the most powerful thing we can understand is that God, the creator of everything, wants a relationship with us. It was what I was detailing out last week, is that who is God? What an interesting question, that most people now are asking who is God, not should I believe in God? Because there's just too much out there that just has no explanation, and it's so powerful to know that there's gotta be something else out there. Well, I want to tell you today, you can know that something else, and that something has a name. His name's God, he has a son named Jesus who came to this earth to make it possible for you to have a relationship with him. I love the intimacy that God's word uses and the authors of the Bible use to describe God's word. Very popular verse, maybe you've heard it before, Psalm 119, 105. It says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, for a long time I read this as someone who is reading this in this day and age. Oh, a lamp, and I think of a flashlight that shows you the whole trail, shows you the whole distance. But when the psalmist was writing this, they didn't have battery-powered electric flashlights. Just in case you didn't know that, they didn't have that in the biblical context of when things were written. They had these little oil lamps, and that didn't shine much light. But what it did do is you could hold it down to your feet. It's why it says your lamp to my feet and a light into my path because you could hold it down by your feet and see what your next step was. See, sometimes the Bible may not tell you exactly everything that you want to know about life, but I promise you, I can stand today and promise you, it will illuminate for you your next step. Sometimes it's getting back in community on a Sunday morning at a church. Sometimes it's taking a step into community by joining a circle. Sometimes it's getting connected to serving in your purpose. I talked about the home team earlier, right? Like God says there's nothing like making a difference. He says you are a masterpiece. Turn to the person next to you, tell them, hey, you're a masterpiece. You're a masterpiece. And right after that, it says you're a masterpiece created to do what? Created to do good works that God purposed you for a long time ago. See, I love, the, I love that there's people who give of themselves to make this happen. And listen, today is growth track. And over the next two weeks, it's combined growth track. I mean, you can knock out two steps in one. I love that. Two in one, let's go. Two for one, that's why I love Publix, man. Buy one, get one. Even if it's something I don't need, I'm getting it because I can get two for the price of one. Well, today, two steps of growth track for the price of one because we believe in your purpose so much. And you can sign up, even if you don't have time today, you can sign up for the home team at our circles area after service. Listen, if you can help out once a month in our kids area, we could really use you because we're building an amazing community over there. My son's one of them. He's cute. He'd love to hang out with you. But if you want to learn how to even do production stuff or take pictures, or you just love welcoming people, I promise you if you could just commit to serving and helping once a month over the next season, it's going to be a lamp unto your feet where God shows you who you are and shows you how powerful the purpose inside you is to make a difference in other people. Here's why God's word is so powerful. Again, Matthew chapter 24, here's what Jesus says. He says, heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not. Underline that phrase for me. See, we understand this statement. How many of us are still dealing with names that people called us in school? I'm still dealing with it when kids in second grade called me big head, right? Like luckily I grew into my head, but they they, they called me that and I had big red hair, so it was not good. And I still remember that. I still deal with it every now and then, all right? Uh, But some of us, we carry labels, we carry the names people give us and we understand, yeah, words don't pass away. They carry meaning, they last whether it's things our friends said to us or our parents said to us. I want you to know today in this book, in the God's word is life. It's words of life. It's words of truth. It's words of hope and honor and joy and just who God is. And I promise you, it will not pass away. Jesus is saying, hey, all the stuff that you see, it's gonna pass away. But what has been said by the mouth of God will last forever. It's pretty important to lean into. Pretty important to know What's being said? Why the Bible, number two, is that it's God's self-revelation to his people. If I was to have a relationship with someone, it's kind of up to them to reveal themselves to me, who they are. Like as Adrian and I continue in our marriage, we're always revealing more of ourselves to the other person. You learn more and more about each other. And God didn't just say, hey, all right, I created you. Now figure me out on your own. (laughs) That'd be really frustrating. He didn't do that at all. He's revealed himself to us. If you wanna know what God is like, this is a pretty good place to start. If you wanna know what God says about you and about this world and about certain topics, this is a good place to start. God himself wrote this book. The words of God are on these pages that I'm looking at right now. 
See, in a relationship, people must self-define who they are, and God has done that. I love, even at, even at a young age, my son Shepard is, is asking questions about God, right? We have this little book that we read to him every night about God, and, and it's about certain stories in the Bible, and, and one of the things that we're working with him is to know that God's with him no matter what throughout the day. And we were coming home from school the other day, and we were just talking about uh, his behavior at school and how he does such a great job until rest time, right? Like rest time, he just loves life too much. He don't want to lay on his cot. I understand that. Now I understand that as a kid. Now I'm like, man, if I could have a cot at work and I could be forced to nap for an hour, yes, let's go somebody. I would be there all day. But for Shepard, he's learning like, okay, I, I got to rest and I got to slow down. And we taught him this verse, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that God is with you. And so we were walking through this verse the other day in my car. He's in his car seat behind me. And I said, Shepard, remember, during rest time, it's really important to be still and what? And he goes, and know that God is with you. He says it in his cute little voice. It's awesome. Makes me cry every time. But there was something really powerful that he said right afterwards. He said, but Daddy, if God's with me all the time and I can be still, I don't see God. I don't see Jesus. And I explained to him, well, Shepard, you, you know what the wind is, right? You see its effect that it has on the trees and things like that? He's like, I said, he said, yes. And I said, well, that's what God is. He's always with you. You see his effect in your life as he helps you be still and slow down and be at peace. And I said, do you understand? And he said, yeah, Daddy, I do. I'm telling you, this is an honest conversation. And that gave me so much joy to do that. And I always want to relate this to you. As an earthly father, that gave me so much joy to reveal to my son who God is. As your heavenly father, can I encourage you today that he really does enjoy telling you who he is, telling how he's always with you. I've been there for you. I haven't forgotten about you. I haven't left you. I've made a way for you to know who I am and find the meaning and purpose of this life. So what I want to do is get really practical for a few minutes and give you quickly, as quickly as I can, it's going to be a lot, it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose for a little bit right here, but I want to give you seven reasons you can trust the Bible. And here's why this is important. In 1 Peter chapter 3, the Apostle Peter tells us this, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord, pretty easy commandment, honor Jesus above everything, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, underline this phrase for me, a reason for the hope that is in you. I love, but this line's important too, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Now I'm gonna do this with gentleness and respect today, but I'm gonna tell you why I'm just not taking a chance on this stuff. There's actual validation to why there's a reason I have hope in this stuff. And that's what I wanna give you today. So when people, people say things about the Bible that is just not true. They say it's fake, that it's not real stuff. No, it really has been around for a long time. I'm gonna tell you today that, that when you hear people say, well, we don't have the original versions of the text, that is a flat out lie. They, they just don't even know what they're talking about because we do more so than any other historical book. And then the other thing is, is that it wasn't really taken seriously and that's not true either because the word of God was seen as utmost importance back in biblical culture. The guys that would copy these stories from generation to generation, man, they took intricate care and detail with what they were doing. So let me give you these quick seven reasons, all right? So seven reasons why, yes, you can trust the Bible, all right? First thing is, is the character of God. The first reason you can trust the Bible is because we see a character in this book who calls himself God. And one of the best verses, one of the most popular verses in our life today, in our world today, that a lot of people know is John 3.16. Probably after Genesis 1.1, people know what John 3.16 somewhat says. For God so loved the world. What is the character of God? That he loves the world that he created. That he gave his only son something of utmost importance and precious to him. He gave that to the world so that whoever believes in him should not perish, that they would be protected from harm and have eternal life forever. This verse details the character of God. People say that if you look at this in stanzas, in a few words at a time, you see the character of God. God so loved the world. God so loves you. Not just, hey, I love you, buddy. No, so, more of those than you could possibly imagine. We can't detail it in English how much God loves you. And he proved it. The character of God, how did he prove that he loved us? By giving us something that was of utmost value and importance to him, his son. So that an action step that he invites us to take to believe in him so that then we can be protected from death and harm for eternity we can be with him. You see the character of God in this line. 
So wait, if this is the character of God, then maybe there's something to be said about it. If this is the character of God, maybe it is something I can trust in. I mean, if I were to tell you this, hey, you know what? I love you so much. I'm gonna give you the most precious thing in my life so that you can be protected, even in the difficult times you go through, even in the pain you experience, so that you can know that I'm with you forever. You say, oh my gosh, you're the best friend I've ever had. I wanna spend more time with you. God has said it right here in these words. He's proven his character to you. He's shown you who he is. The second thing is, is divine authorship. Divine authorship. I love that it says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. It's divine authorship. And it's so important to remember that again, men wrote these words, but it was inspired by God. The Holy Spirit told them what to put down in these pages. There's a quote by a theologian, uh, G.K. Chesterton, if you can throw it up on the screen. I think it's really important to lean into this. It says, when men stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. That's really dangerous. So what I want to give you today is to realize you don't have to believe in anything, because that's even more dangerous sometimes. You can believe in what God says. I brought this with me today. If you've ever seen one of these, a little balancing thing. I, I made you a lot, gave you a lot of anxiety on the ladder last week, so I figured I'd do it again <laughs> on this little thing. Um, but I'll, I think a lot of times, and I'm going to use this as an example so I actually don't fall, or like as a prop so I don't fall off the stage. But a lot of times in life, this is what we're doing, right? We're trying to figure out, okay, what am I supposed to do? Uh, why am I here? Is this the right job for me? Is this the right relationship for me? And if anyone is looking at me right now, you're like, that guy looks ridiculous. <laughs> and sometimes in our life, it's, I'm putting so much effort to try and balance on this thing. If I can do it without it. Oh, look at me. But still, this is, I don't want to live my life this way, right? This is not fun. It's building my core, yes. But I don't want to live this way because every day I'm trying to figure out, is this right? Am I supposed to move this way or move that way? And see, God's given us a thing to where we don't have to struggle with deep philosophical questions all the time. It's divinely authored. When I look in what this says, I see the character of God. Another way to look, think of it, is this way. And again, we don't believe in luck here, so I'm about to open this, so don't freak out, all right? Um, like, a lot of us, it's like, I understand what this umbrella is for. If it's raining outside, I put this over my head to protect myself from the rain. But the way I think some of us sometimes approach the Bible is we know what it's for, we know it can protect us, but we walk out into the world and we're like, all right, it's raining, but I'm holding it way over here. Not too close, because, you know, I don't want to get too much into my business. And we get soaked. We get damaged. Because we're not willing to bring it in close and say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to surrender my control to this. And I'm going to let this cover me. I'm going to let this protect me. Because this thing I'm holding in my hands is divinely authored by God. And that's why it can prove the test of time. For those of you that had the anxiety about, please close that. I don't know, is a black cat gonna show up? Are you gonna walk under the ladder this time, right? But it's divinely authored. It's God-breathed. It's in, in scripture, they say 3,000 times, this is the word of the Lord. This is what God says. Because they know it's not what I say, it's what God says. Jesus himself, the son of God, said, hey, here is what God has commanded. Here is what God has said. Here is the divine author working these things out for you so you can see who he is. Character of God, divinely authored. Third thing is unity of message. Remember how I said before, 40 different authors, three different continents, three different languages, 2,000 years, one message. One message. God created us. We messed up. God made a way for us to be redeemed through his son, Jesus. And Jesus is coming back again, and we get to spend eternity with him when we believe and surrender our lives to him. Because God is as righteous as he is loving. The unity of the message is that, yes, God loves us, but he's also righteous and just. Meaning that when we have broken the laws of creation that he established, yes, we were given the choice to love him, but also... We were made unclean, unrighteous. But God didn't just leave us there and say, hey, you figure it out. He said, you know what? I'm gonna send my son. I so love the world. I'm gonna bring you back into relationship with me. It just takes another action, another choice of surrendering. To say in Psalm 18, God's way is what? Perfect? All the Lord's promises prove what? True? He's a shield for all who look to him for protection? If I, if I told you, hey, I have a message that is true and perfect, you'd probably wanna know what it is in the pages of this handheld miracle called God's word. And the unity of the message is powerful. It's about Jesus. 
and it stands the test of time. Now, those are a little bit bird's eye view. What I want to do right now is the next few, I want to give you extremely practical reasons why this is true, why you can trust this thing I hold in my hand called the Bible, called God's Word. Number four is fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy. Meaning that the Bible says things and predicts things that then come true. That the Bible talks about things that are going to happen. Now, there's a ton of them, but I'm going to use one very specific one. And again, in Isaiah 53, 5, it says, But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. I don't know about you, I read that verse, and that sounds like Jesus to me. Well, that verse was written hundreds upon hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up on the scene. But it was prophesying exactly what he was going to do, pierced with nails through his hands, that he would take on the sins of us all, that he was whipped so that we could be healed and forgiven. See, there's over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled just in his life alone. That's just with Jesus. There's way more that I'm gonna get to in a second. But with just Jesus, there's over 300 prophecies that told where he would be born, that he would be born of a virgin, that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver when he would be betrayed, that he would be whipped and beaten beyond recognition, beyond recognition that he would be led like a, a quiet lamb to the slaughter. And if you read the crucifixion story, you see Jesus was quiet the entire time. It's prophecy after prophecy that is fulfilled. And they say that for one person to fulfill just a handful, remember, there's over 300 of them, but for one person to fulfill all of these prophecies and it's historical record that this happened, it would be like covering the state of Texas with quarters and I painted one quarter red and I blindfolded you and I, and I told you, okay, start here at the top of Texas and walk all the way across and try and find that quarter. It ain't happening. But that's why this fulfilled prophecy is a miracle. That all these things that were said about Jesus, from the prophet of Isaiah to Zephaniah and Zechariah to even the psalmist David, there's unity in the message. There's unity in what it says. There's unity that Jesus, there's fulfilled prophecy that Jesus would rise from the dead and be alive. It's fulfilled. I want you to know today, we can trust what the Bible says because it's proven the future before. It's proven what's going to happen. It's proven what's coming. We can trust it and stand on it. The, th the fifth thing is scientific accuracy. Scientific accuracy. In Isaiah 40, 20, 44, 24, it says, I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens. That's what I told you last week. The Bible was the first historical ancient text to talk about how the universe is expanding. And it's something that's just been discovered scientifically within the last hundred years. But, the Psalm, uh, but Isaiah, the prophet, said it a long time ago. Hey, where we live, it's expanding because God is constantly doing a new thing. God is constantly speaking and moving. There's scientific accuracy within what we hold to be true. And it's, you even find it in outside reports of what was going on in the life of Jesus. See, I, I can quote a lot of things from here and show you that, man, it's accurate, it's true. See, one of the greatest authors in all of history is a guy named Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. He wrote the book of Acts. You know, Paul wrote more books, but Luke wrote more words. And I believe Luke would be seen as one of the most important historical voices if his book wasn't contained in this thing. Because people have some sort of prejudice towards this book because sometimes it hits us in the face with brutal honesty about who we are and about what we need to do. But see, what Luke did that was so powerful is that Luke predicted, I believe if we have a slide for it, I think I can remember it though, that Luke predicted over 42 countries, 52, there, there it is. In the book of Acts, Luke names 32 countries, 54 cities and nine islands without an error and all have been identified today through archeology. span Didn't know anything about them, but he wrote about them and he categorized them. It's been proven today. It's scientifically accurate. But Luke is a voice inside the Bible, I get that. So let's look at some other voices outside the Bible. How can we know that it's scientifically and historically accurate? Well, there's a historian by the, guy, by the name of Josephus, great name. He was a Jewish historian. Here's what he said. He lived around the same time as Paul and Luke. It's about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accepting truth, accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. And when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross. 
Those who had first come to love him did not and did not cease. He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life. For the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of the Christians, so-called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. A historian, he's got nothing to, he's got no skin in the game. He's a Jewish historian, not a Christian, not a necessarily believer of Jesus. But what he observed and what he wrote down, couldn't deny it. Let's go outside of even Jewish tradition. Let's go to the Roman historian Tacitus, another great name. Here's what he says about Jesus. Nero inflicted the most exquisite, exquisite tortures on a class called Christian. Christus, meaning the Christ from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. What is this saying? Proving everything that the Bible says. Historically accurate, scientifically accurate. The next thing to understand is that number six is archeological finds. I just wanted you to write down the word archeological today. <laughs> archeological finds. That there has never been one dug up archeological find that has disproven what we, seen in, what we see in the Bible. Psalm 86, 85, 11, truth springs up from the earth and righteousness smiles down from heaven. I love this phrase. You guys imagine we're finding all these things true, like, oh man, this is true, this is real. And God's like, yeah, I told you. I told you it was real. I told you it's true. Uh, as we begin to close today, I wanna share with you something that maybe you've never seen before, but I'm gonna show you a graph about the Bible. And what this is, is this is a picture of all the texts and, and sources that we have of ancient copies of, of books and things. So up here you see Homer and the Iliad, a book that's taught in schools, but that's widely regarded as historical conceptuals or context of what happened long time ago. We go down to Plato and his book like The Republic, and again, things that is still taught in philosophy and things that is looked as primary sources and documents, all the way again through Caesar and Tacitus, Demosthenes. And at the bottom here, we have the New Testament. What I want you to see is that the time gap from the earliest copies that we have, from when it was written to when we found copies, look at the top six or seven there, 400 years. The copy that we have written, for, uh, obtained 400 years after it was written, 1,000, 1,300 years, 1,400 years, 750 years. It's a long time. So I write something and then it's copied, copied, and the earliest copy we have is 1,000 years later. Look at what it says about the New Testament, 50 years. 100 years, a complete version of the New Testament, only 200 years, which again, they were so specific about copying this thing down. We have the real thing. And then you see on the, the number of copies we have, the most we have is the Iliad. Well, quote unquote, the most, because then we have eight and seven and 200. We have over 5,000 proven copies of the Bible that is scientific archeological record showing that what we have is written near when Jesus actually walked the earth. Over 5,000 proofs? What? If I were to tell you I love you a 5,000 times, you'd be like, all right, I get it, man. If I were to send you 5,000 happy birthday cards, you'd be like, this guy really wants to wish me a happy birthday. God's done it 5,000 times, still to this day. Let me close with this, this other historical fact, and we'll close here, is these things called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls found in 1947 contained Old Testament manuscripts 1,000 years older than any manuscripts we had. When compared to what is in my hand right now, it was found that it was 99.5% in agreement with what was written thousand years older than so BC many years before Jesus 99.5 percent accurate to what I'm holding in my hand do we have the original thing yeah is this really the word of God that stood the test of time yes because the reason I can trust the Bible number seven is that it has life-changing power no other book has life-changing power as we close today John 14 6 Jesus told him I am the way truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you're looking for truth today, it's in your hands, in the Word of God, through the life-changing power of who He is. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today as we finish?